Hey, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games, a co-founder and managing director. Chris, I wanted to chat with you about something that's kind of unique to you guys at Grinding Gear Games. We're like three or four years removed since you announced the first Exile Con, and that ended up being held back in November 2019. And the first thing I want to ask is, what made you guys even want to take something like this on? Like, this is a Herculean task. So what made you want to put your own convention together? Well, there were two factors there. The first one was we'd really loved interacting with fans at the small fan meetups that we did overseas. Every time we made it to say GDC or E3 or whatever, we'd try to run a fan meetup and they were amazing. You get to see some really avid players, get some great stories. And it honestly like humanizes the whole development process because we're based in New Zealand. And while there are part of Exile players here, it just isn't the same population that you have in say the States. And so um, we wanted to bring that joy of me meeting and interacting with fans to the entire development team. In addition, we at the time were looking to announce Path of Exile 2. And of course, running our own convention for that would be the perfect venue where we can, you know, perfectly control the situation and create a really magical moment to announce that game. And what sorts of obstacles did you hit in putting the con together? Like, was there anything that you didn't necessarily expect to run into over the course of trying to organize it? Oh, everything that could go wrong behind the scenes did go wrong, if you see what I mean. Like, there was this moment where we um, were working on our XLCon stuff and it was our first convention of any type we've done. Like we're not event organizers, we're game developers. And the uh, Fire Festival documentaries came out. And so we watched them for the laughs. And there was this moment about halfway through the first documentary where, where I realized this is my life. Like this is about to happen. What? Are, how are we gonna run this convention? And so it took a lot of work to avoid disaster, but thankfully everything went smooth and without a hitch on the day, which was, which was really good. And there were no issues trying to like bring in all the talent because like I know that you had Kriparian come in and help out with the with the kickoff show and everything else. Like was there were there any issues like getting people visas or anything like that or any travel yeah. issues that you ran into? It was all totally smooth. Everyone was super keen to come over and help out. And you know, it was pre-pandemic, so it was really easy to get people over. The fans managed to get here, have a great time. It it went really well. How do you feel that Exile Con itself went? Like how would you describe it in terms of like tr uh attendee turnout and atmosphere and everything else? Well, we packed that we packed the venue which was our goal and the the atmosphere was just electric like there was just this this magical something in the air going on there and it we we could feel it from the stage when we were doing the presentations and the attendees could feel it that um you know it was really special and there were a number of factors there we tried very hard to create a a good show in the venue in terms of having all the you know set dressing and stuff that we could and allocated a lot of budget towards that but in addition we uh, put together a, a card game that the attendees could play, which we hadn't announced beforehand. It was a surprise for people who turned up and that involved interacting with a lot of Grinding Gear Games staff. And so it kind of broke the ice where it was okay for attendees to come and interrogate their favorite developers about why they ruined the game in the way they did. Now, this is part of the reason that I wanted to talk to you about Exile Con, and that's because it's a really, it's really unique in the way that it was, it happened right before the COVID-19 pandemic started. And you talk about uh, the studio is based in New Zealand, and we've seen how strict New Zealand is when it comes to locking down. So mm -hmm. I can only imagine what would have happened if ExileCon had been scheduled for like a few months later. So yeah, exactly. I'd like I to ask, like, what would the effect have been if the convention had ultimately been cancelled? Well, that would have been terrible. We would not have got our money back from what we would have spent on it. And it would have meant that we would have had to have sort of shifted to an online announcement for Path of Exile 2. And that would not have been the same. Like, there's something about actually having a convention center full of people who get to experience it firsthand and the validation that those people can then go upstairs to a set of a couple of hundred computers and actually play through the first act of the game and leave the convention saying this is a real thing it has the quality that we just got shown that was really important um inevitably life would have gone on of course and people would have understood but it's really good that we got to run the convention and have it go off without a hitch mere months before it would have been impossible you mentioned a lot of those venue fees not being refundable. Like about how much did the studio end up spending on the convention? Um, we spent about 1.1 million New Zealand dollars on the convention. And that, I mean, it turns out like talking to other game companies who do conventions, that's relatively cheap, but we always have tried to be frugal and do a lot of stuff ourselves. Like, you know, it's one of those things where if you want a company to just magically make a convention for you, you can drop five, 10, $50 million on that happening and they'll do it. Um, we tried very hard to recoup fees through like you know, merchandise and ticket sales and so on. And overall, you know, we probably took a three or 400,000 New Zealand dollar loss on it, which is a good marketing expense for the amount of exposure the Path of Exile 2 had. And that was exactly what we were trying to achieve with it. And had the pandemic not gone down the way it did, would you would the team have moved forward with a second Exile Con? 
That's a really, really interesting question and one that we have pondered because a day before ExileCon, if you'd have said to me, is there going to be another one of these? I would have said in the peak of stress with the event about to be the next day, I would have said absolutely never again are we going to do this is my response a day beforehand. If you'd have asked me a day afterwards, I would have said 100% is happening in 12 months, right? Ready to announce that kind of thing. And then COVID happened. And to some extent, that was a good thing because the problem with running annual conventions is you need something cool to talk about. And we're not able to make a game of Path of Exiles 2, Path of Exile 2's caliber every single year. And so the COVID pandemic has forced us to delay a potential second ExileCon until the point where we have a lot of stuff to talk about again, which realistically is probably close to Path of Exile 2's release. And so that's a nice gap in timing between conventions where if we were to run another one, which is by no means guaranteed, but it's certainly something we're discussing, then we can actually have a lot of Path of Exile stuff to talk about and show off there. So what's interesting about a potential second ExileCon is, you know, here in America, everything's like back to normal. and what what's what's unusual about that is the pandemic is technically not over like everything's opening up and going back to normal but covid numbers are starting to go up again now mm. based in new zealand if there's even a sign of an outbreak everything starts to lock down again so with that in mind would your team even want to attempt a second exile con in new zealand knowing there's a chance that lockdown is always potentially around the corner yeah, it's certainly a risk and we would undertake it knowing that there's a chance that it can't go ahead. And fair enough, if it's a public safety thing, we would not want people to get sick attending ExileCon. That's not its purpose. Um, but at the same time, if we are running another one, it's something we'll just have to take into account, right? That there's a chance that it doesn't occur. And New Zealand's been more clear about their policies about this stuff. After Omicron, with the inevitability of a lot of people getting sick, like it went from basically no one had ever had COVID in New Zealand by January of this year to now 50% of the population probably has due to you know Omicron being pretty spready. Um, they are saying that unless there's some kind of crazy new variant that is really bad in some way, it's unlikely they'll do big lockdowns as a way of controlling it. They'll probably just have um, uh, convention limits on the number of attendees, which would also cancel ExileCon. Like if they say you're allowed 100 people in the venue, then that means we can have our production staff to do the show, but we cannot have any attendees. So basically if there's a bad COVID outbreak, there is no Excel con, but that's a reality of doing business in the modern world is you have to, you know, have a lot of contingencies. Sort of a new reality that we're living in. And that does lead me to ask, do you want to go back to those smaller fan meetups that you've been doing before the pandemic? Do you want to go back to kind of that pattern of meeting up with the fan base around the world? I definitely want to do that every time we happen to travel to another city. I personally haven't traveled to the United States for a number of years now because of COVID. And um, certainly next time I'm going to GDC or anything like that, we'll you know, send a message out on Twitter that if anyone wants to meet up, they're welcome to. But those things, you know, they don't really have an agenda. They're kind of like 30 or 40 fans who turn up, whoever's available on the day and um, you know, meeting who, whichever developers are available. And those are fun and great to do, but they're not really a venue for making a big announcements or showing off demos of the game. Like if we rocked up to one of those with a laptop and a copy of Peewee 2, I'm sure a lot of people online would feel they missed out on playing that. You mentioned wanting to like have something to show off. Like about how far would you say Path of Exile 2 is in development? It's really, really undergone quite a rapid acceleration and development um, over the last even like six months. Um, we've gone through the pre-production stage where we're establishing the quality that we want and now we're just churning ahead on making content. And so, you know, it's too early to even indicate rough announcement dates, but we're working very hard on it. And, you know, I suspect we'll see great progress over it this year and much of it finished over next year. And, and it's really funny that like, you don't intend to like, you know, quote unquote, steal thunder from like Blizzard and Diablo, but like ExileCon just happened to fall around the time that Diablo 4 was announced. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is that you also announced Path of Exile Mobile, like right around the time that of uh, Diablo Immortal came out, uh, was announced. So I want to ask like how far Path of Exile Mobile is coming along. We're targeting a similar release window to Path of Exile 2. Our goal basically is that the two can help each other with regard to marketing. When Path of Exile 2 comes out, people can also play Path of Exile Mobile, which is a different game. You know, it's got a different campaign, different storyline. Obviously, it plays differently because it's on phone. It's a pretty different experience. And the two games will be available probably at roughly the same time, I would expect. It certainly was um, an interesting experience trying to work out how do we announce a mobile product and also the standalone sequel, especially given the, the troubles that the studios have faced. And it's not just Blizzard, other people also have announced mobile products. And if it isn't exactly the right day and the fans aren't in exactly the right mood, then it can be difficult. And so we had the ability, thankfully, to go second there and to 
carefully phrase things and to put, you know, start with Path of Exile 2 is the first thing we showed off to make sure people understood that that was coming and that was for them before we talked about a mobile product, which many people may feel is not directly aimed at them, but instead at a wider mobile audience. And so that, that really helps that we were able to, um, we knew to take a moment and think about how it was going to be received before we presented it. And lastly, for me, to bring it all back around full circle, uh, tell me about some of your favorite memories from Exilecon. There are so many cool things that happen at Exilecon. The most impactful for me is walking out onto the stage knowing that I was about to announce Path of Exile 2 in mere seconds and I should not cry. And you can look at the footage of that and I mostly held it together, but it was such an emotional such an emotional announcement, this thing that the team have been working on for so long that we were so keen to get feedback on that we knew was so high quality. And the people in front of us had no idea it was coming, right? Like we talked vaguely about how there was a 4.00 patch that we were working on, which had some new campaign content they could play through. Many people assumed it was like our previous, you know, expansions we'd done where there's some new stuff for them to play, maybe a large one, but revealing it as a sequel with an entirely new campaign and new character classes and basically a redone game was a big secret to keep. And we had a trailer that we were really pleased with and a demo we were really pleased with. And they'd got all the way into watching to that point in the presentation without knowing it was about to be announced. And so it was just such an emotional thing announcing it, but there were plenty of other big highlights. Um, my main experience at the convention was that as soon as I left anywhere to go to another place, I was mobbed with people who wanted stuff to be signed to the point where we had this after party where you know we had the, the convention center available and there were you know people get some drinks and snacks and just chat with each other so i left the staff room to go and have a walk around and i got maybe one meter out the door before a gentleman comes up and says chris great to meet you could i please have a signature and i said absolutely how are you enjoying the convention so far so i signed his thing and then i see there's 20 or 30 people behind him in a line so i figure okay cool well i'll sign their stuff as well and then someone brought me a desk and a chair and some food and a beer and i was there the entire party you know, until they kicked us out of the venue at midnight or whatever it was, and I had to sign stuff in the rain outside. And that that sticks with me because it was special for the, the attendees and for the developers because we got to meet each other. And most of the staff in New Zealand have never been to any kind of gaming convention overseas. Like the number of people that have been to PAX or GDC, it's so small um, for New Zealand developers that the chance for them to interact with people who, whose lives they have influenced um, was really powerful for them. And it totally motivated the team in order to meet their fans. And that's so that's so interesting that you mentioned that because it's true. We don't see a lot of this kind of a convention of this capacity going towards that region. We never see anything like the Oceanic region or Australia or New Zealand or anything like that. So that's really interesting to hear that you get that kind of reception out there and that you get and you can make those memories with such a large group of people. And that's really heartening to hear. And I hope you guys can do a second exile con someday and you know, maybe we'll see it. Maybe hopefully COVID will, COVID will go back down, and you know we can go back to a better state of normal. So, yeah. Chris, really thank, you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. This was a wonderful conversation, and this was it's great to hear that Path of Exile Two is coming along as well as it is, and hopefully you guys have a lot more to show off. Maybe if not necessarily at an Exile Con Two, then you know maybe at an online convention or at a different in a different country sometime. Yeah, we're really looking forward to showing you. My name's Rory Rackham. I'm lead game designer at Grand Gear Games. Rory, before I get to asking about uh, the specific boss battle that I wanted to ask about, I wanted yeah, to yeah. ask about the creation of creating a Path of Exile boss just in general. Like, what can you tell me about the general creation process? Um, a lot of them start in slightly different ways. They're starting from a theme or they're starting from a mechanic. Usually we say, what is one sort of special gimmick, some sort of thing that makes this fight unlike any other fight in the game. Um, something that will mean you can't just do the same thing you do every other boss fight. If you have to like think about a new mechanic that is changing how you play, really. Um, and something to discover and push you to your limits, really. And I also want to ask, like, what are some of the bigger challenges in creating an engaging boss fight, especially with like as updates go on, you know that certain player builds are going to be overpowered, possibly broken. You know that there's going to be a streamer out there on Twitch that's going to discover like this build that like just wrecks everything on screen. Like, so what is the key to creating an engaging boss battle in that instance? That's that's a really tricky thing, and there's always going to be a point. It's kind of a goal for your character to one day be able to cheese any boss fight. Um, there's there's no way 
well, it's kind of in a way intentional that there's no way around that because you'll always push your point, yourself to a point where you can do that. But there'll always be a point in your character's development where you are challenged by it. And that that's sort of the thing we, we push for to keep that, keep that space kind of broad. So it's not like a, too early in your character's lifespan that they can get through the stuff. But um, it's also, we, we don't, do too much of the sort of invulnerability phase where now you've got five seconds of you've got to dodge the thousand fireballs but we try and keep the stuff so this part is so scary that you've just got to stop what you're doing and just focus on the special mechanic until it's over with so with the sentinel update you've mm -hmm. gone into the business of creating uber bosses and for today i wanted to talk about a specific fight that was kind of uber to begin with and i'm talking about the uber elder fight which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one pits the players against the Elder and the Shaper both at the same time. So I guess first I want to ask about the vanilla version of this encounter. Tell me about the vanilla version of this encounter and then uh, tell me what you've gone, how you've gone about making it Uber. Right, right. So, I mean, it's been a, it's been a long time since we introduced the, the first Uber fight, um, which was really, uh, we didn't have a huge, well, we had a big plan for it involving a, a giant brain version of the elder boss fight which we later reused for the maven fight when we had time to do it properly but we didn't really have the way to do, do it justice so we in the sort of special mechanic with that we pushed for the like very cin cinematic feel to it where it makes it feel like a big uh encounter with you fighting alongside people and against multiple enemies as a like climactic story like epic end to a story um and so that inspired a lot of the mechanics of pushing, pull, pulling in different entities at different times and having to deal with a um, sort of, while while Zana is doing her cinematic thing, you're fighting off the bosses. Um, so when it came to the Uber Elder version, the Uber Uber version, we really just wanted to take a fight that people had become comfortable with over time. They'd learned the mechanics so well and they knew exactly what to expect and just throw some extra wrenches in there have it so that there are phases where you previously knew what you're doing but now you're having to juggle multiple things at once and also making sure that the penalties for failing penalties for making any mistake is a, a lot higher there's mechanics that in the regular fight will disappear after time but in this uber version they'll stick around so if you take too long then you fill up the arena more and more with things that you can't avoid and you mentioned earlier about like every boss has its own gimmick, especially as you know development for new updates goes on. So is the is there a similar process to Uberifying the other bosses, like or have you taken different design routes for something like, let's say for example, the Uber Eater of Worlds? Mm -hmm. That one was very much a well. The regular fight is you're dealing with one thing at a time. You sort of the boss is doing one ability and you're avoiding that ability. For the Uber version, there's much more of a multiple things going on at once there's tentacles there's all these tentacles everywhere coming at you whenever you're in a phase that you're previously com comfortable just running around and escaping things um so it's really a like now you're having to think a lot harder and the same strategies don't quite work because you can't just run in a straight line to a point you're having to think about where he's going to slam you with his tentacles next um so a lot of them were like taking taking anything that is uh we had the ability to easily tweak i mean a lot of it is uh, same with all the boss design you've got to play around with it a lot to know what feels fun and challenging it's easy to come up with an idea but getting the timing just right it takes a while so with these fights that are already established and with the fact that we had to do seven of them um, in rapid succession it was very much what what numbers do we actually have to play around with here what can we what can a designer just do do in a day and try out and see what makes this fight challenging without being impossible is this idea of an uber boss battle something that's going to continue in future updates like for example if you're going to introduce a new boss in the next update can players expect to see like an uber version of that boss in the update after it's quite a good way to deal with sort of high-end power creep because we can take an old take old content that well year by year players get stronger and stronger as we introduce new mechanics and we buff skills that were underpowered and the sort of the bar raises and raises for what a character is capable of especially at the high end so the uber mechanic is a good way to take something that 
what is no longer the most challenging content in the game and bring it back up to that point again. <laughs> At the same time, we don't want these Uber encounters to be a, you have to complete this to feel like you've completed the game. They don't have incredible rewards every single time you do them. So you feel bad if you're not doing a Uber version of a fight. Um, they're more, uh, you really want to push yourself because characters are now capable of doing incredible amounts of damage and incre having incredible amounts of survivability. And here's where they can push themselves to their limits, even on old content that they were previously cheesing. And how important is it to come up with like that unique mechanic on an Uber boss fight, as opposed to just like power creeping it, upping its HP and just do something like that. Like while that can be a thing, you don't want to make it the only thing, right? Yeah, it's it's all about pushing your brain into that state of I'm no longer just doing the same thing I was doing as I was charging through maps, just pressing all the buttons I'm used to pressing. It's now a like I have to I have to activate my brain. This is the this is the high adrenaline moment in between the the cruisy part of just charging through the regular game. And lastly, for me, what's been your favorite Uber boss to put together? Like what 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 has excited you to go back to and be like, I can make this better. <laughs> Uh, um, that's a good question. The, I think probably it is the Eater of Worlds because it was already like, it's a very flavorful and fight, but it wasn't a super challenging fight. So being able to push it to that super challenging level is really fun. Um, and more tentacles is always better. More tentacles is always better. That's a great lesson for life. <laughs> Rory, thank you so much for, for chatting with us and for telling us a little bit about the about these Uber bosses. And right now we're gonna take, we're gonna show off a little bit of footage of the Uber of the Uber Elder and the Uber Eater of Worlds. So thank you. Thanks for having so me. Chat to you later. Uh,